We have the pleasure of hosting a grand round in honor of Dr. Stanley Sedler. The Sedler Lectureship is awarded to a clinician educator that embodies the spirit of Dr. Sedler. Dr. Stanley Sedler completed his residency at the Mount Sinai Hospital in 1956 and became the Director of Medicine at Elmhurst Medical Center from 1964 to 1987. Dr. Sedler was also a renowned professor of clinical medicine at the School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He was famed for his yearly clinical pathology conferences during which he would be presented with extremely difficult cases and challenged to deliver the correct diagnosis. Dr. Sucker was best known as an outstanding diagnostician with an encyclopedic knowledge of internal medicine and served as a lasting inspiration to hundreds of residents and students. He is remembered, he's remembered, remembered by many as a legend. This year's Sucker Lectureship is awarded to Dr. Roger Stavantin. Dr. Stavantin is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Cardiology and Population Health and Science and Policy. He earned his MPH from UC Berkeley and his medical degree from UCSF, where he was inducted into the AOA and the Gold-Headed Canes Society. He completed his internal medicine residency at Brigham and Women's Hospital and subsequently spent one year in El Dorado, Kenya, as a team leader of the India University Kenya Partnership. He then went on to complete his cardiology fellowship at the School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He has made significant contributions in the field of cardiology and global health delivery, and is also regarded as an exceptional clinician educator and has received numerous teaching awards that recognize his excellence in teaching. It is for this reason that Dr. Verdanton is awarded the Sector of Lectureship this year. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rajas Verdanton. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, <clears throat> it's quite an honor to be giving grand rounds uh, to the Department of Medicine, and in particular, uh, in the name of uh, Dr. Stanley Seckler. Uh, and I'll be giving a couple of uh, words about him uh, subsequently in my presentation. But thank you to the chief residents and to the residents. It's uh, really special to be working uh, with the house staff here. Uh, and it's very nice to be recognized in this fashion. So thank you. Uh, the title of my talk today is Promotion of Global Cardiovascular Health, Roadmaps, Implementation, Research. Uh, no uh, corporate disclosures. Uh, these are the NIH and American Heart Association grants that support my work. So the house staff know that I always like to start off with a daily poem before we start rounds. Uh, so I decided to bring one for us today. Eggs by Kay Ryan. We turn out as tippy as eggs. Legs are an illusion. We are held as in a carton if someone loves us. It's a pity only loss proves this. A word about Stanley Seckler. Um, he, uh, I, I did not have the pleasure of meeting him, but from what I've learned, he was an inspiring man uh, and really uh, an exemplar of what we aspire towards in terms of being a clinician, an educator, and a scholar of medicine. So it's really an honor, and I thank the family for being present here today, um, and I think it would have been amazing to have been able to work uh, with him and under him. Uh, he, ha uh, he has a carton that supported him, uh, and the carton uh, was his family. And I think just important to note that uh, as we go through our lives professionally, uh, important to sort of make sure that we nurture ourselves personally as well. A quick word also of thank you to my um, primary mentor here, Dr. Valentin Fuster, who has been incredibly supportive of me and my work, as well as my family uh, and uh, life overall. So thank you, Dr. Fuster. Today's talk, uh, the outline is uh, magnitude of global cardiovascular disease, understanding the trends both over time as well as uh, across geography, and then thinking about roadmaps for cardiovascular health promotion in terms of both implementation and research. Roadmaps for cardiovascular disease have been actually a main priority for the World Heart Federation over the last uh, two to three years. We've, uh, in, in uh, collaboration with some colleagues at the World Heart Federation, we've put together roadmaps for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, tobacco cessation, uh, cholesterol control. And we're in the process of discussing about actually moving now more upstream towards health promotion. So the roadmaps I'll be discussing today are actually about prevention of cardiovascular disease, but I really want us to think about moving more upstream towards health promotion as well. So uh, why do we talk about global cardiovascular disease? I want to sort of just mention here that it's a global problem. So the way to sort of see this, this is from the Global Burden of Disease published by the World Health Organization. The area of these boxes and rectangles is proportional to the amount of deaths, number of deaths in the world. And everything in blue is non-communicable diseases. Everything in red are infectious diseases. Everything in green are injuries and accidents. 
And you can see that the blue dominates the picture here, so non-communicable diseases, the primary burden of uh, death worldwide. And within that blue, you can see here that cardiovascular really dominates, especially ischemic heart disease and stroke. So combined, ischemic heart disease and stroke are the number one killer uh, in the world. Not only is it a problem globally, but it's really in particular a concern for low and middle income countries. So this is a little bit of a loud uh, and multicolored graph. And basically on the x-axis here, you have different regions of the world, uh, Central Europe, Southeast Asia, et cetera, the high income countries, meaning US and Europe here on the far right, and then different causes of death uh, in color bars. What I really want you to focus on are the dark blue. And what you can see here is number of deaths in every single part of the world, low and middle income countries, is greater than the number of deaths in the US and Europe from cardiovascular disease. So what we think of as a disease of high income countries and high resource settings is actually predominantly actually affecting low and middle income countries and low resource settings. Why is this happening? Partly because myocardial infarction actually occurs at a younger age in low and middle income countries. So this is from the Institute of Medicine report that Dr. Fuster chaired in 2010. Low income countries here on the left, high income countries here on the right. And you can see that the average age at first myocardial infarction is actually occurring earlier in low income countries than it is in higher income countries. Uh, a way to sort of look at this over time, uh, this is from Andrew Moran, a colleague at Columbia. He, what he did was very nicely sort of looked over the last two decades from 1990 to 2010 to look at the top causes of death, uh, divided again in the blue by non-communicable disease, the red communicable disease, to see whether they increased over time or decreased over time. So upwards is increased, downwards is decreased. And you can see that every single infectious cause, except for HIV, obviously, because of the uh, decade of the 1990s, uh, has decreased over time. And every single non-communicable disease, in particular, uh, cardiovascular disease has increased except for rheumatic heart disease, which is really infectious in origin. Okay? So not only is it a problem for low and middle income countries, it's actually a growing problem uh, for those places. However, the story is not uniform. Uh, the story is geographically contingent and the story is um, temporarily uh, contingent as well. Uh, again, Andrew Moran in a separate publication has shown us that ischemic heart disease mortality over time in high-income countries has declined, which we all well know. Um, in several low- and middle-income countries, it actually, actually increased. South Asia, Central Europe, uh, and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Central Asia and Eastern Europe, sorry, but has declined in certain places. North Africa has stayed st steady in Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's a little bit of a geographically specific uh, uh, epidemic that we're dealing with. Moving from disease to risk factors, the global burden of disease, uh, and then we put this together in sort of a separate uh, uh, tape, uh, sort of graph, the, has shown that the top six or seven risk factors for disease are all of the classic atherosclerotic risk factors we think about. Dietary risks, high blood pressure, smoking, pollution, both indoor household air pollution as well as outdoor pollution, alcohol, glucose, high body mass index, physical inactivity, and high total cholesterol. All of this above the communicable or infectious disease risk factors that we traditionally think about. And again, it's geographically distinct. Smoking prevalence very high in uh, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, throughout Russia, uh, China in particular. Not as prevalent in Sub-Saharan Africa, in parts of Latin America. Physical inactivity. Uh, men on, top, uh, men uh, on the top of the screen, women on the bottom of the screen, uh, and you can see that, again, there's geographically uh, quite a variation in terms of physical inactivity, and in particular, uh, women have reported greater levels of physical inactivity than men worldwide, uh, almost uh, consistently. So again, we looked at this over time. Uh, this was done with uh, a medical student, actually, Ben Seligman from uh, Stanford, where we looked at risk factors over time across region. And we saw that there's, again, a temporarily dis sort of contingent as well as geographically contingent pattern. Blood pressure tends to decline in most places, but has started to increase recently in several parts of the world. Uh, BMI has basically consistently increased over parts of the world, but cholesterol overall has declined over the last two decades. So again, when we think about this uh, epidemic of global cardiovascular disease and the risk factors, we have to think about it not as a monolithic picture, but as something that is geographically distinct temporarily distinct, and even risk factor specific. What are the costs associated with this global epidemic? 
uh, quite astounding, actually. So the uh, World Economic Forum, in partnership with the World Health Organization, in the lead-up to the United Nations uh, Global Summit in 2011, published this economic analysis and basically said that all non-communicable diseases together were going to co contribute $47 trillion in costs over the next few decades, and that the, a third of that, ma major part of that, actually was cardiovascular disease. Of note, I just want to say here, something I'm not going to be speaking about today, but huge, is mental illness. Uh, and you can see here that it equals the cost burden of cardiovascular disease. Trillions in terms of my order of magnitude. Just to uh, highlight where are these costs coming from, this is from a colleague, Tom Gaziano at Harvard, uh, where he looked at over the next decade costs related to suboptimal blood pressure or hypertension. And the total cost was nearly 400 billion per year. And everyone says that it's costly to treat cardiovascular disease and risk factors in low and middle income countries. But actually only 20% of that cost was related to blood pressure treatment. 80% of that cost is actually due to the complications of hypertension, stroke, ischemic heart disease, and heart failure. So despite the fact that it's expensive to treat uh, hypertension, it's actually much more expensive to ignore it. In contrast, what are the cause costs of the interventions uh, that we can try and put together to prevent or uh, delay the onset of cardiovascular disease? So again, the WHO and the World Economic Forum put this together a few years ago, looking at population level interventions, diet and physical activity, alcohol control, tobacco control. And you can see here on the y-axis, the costs are in the order of the billions. Okay, so contrast that now to trillions in terms of the burden of global cardiovascular disease, and we're here now three orders of magnitude less in terms of intervening to try and prevent them. On a per capita basis, it's less than one dollar per year. Even when we go to individual level interventions, which are obviously more costly, so screening uh, for cardiovascular disease, multi-drug therapy for uh, uh, people with elevated risk, uh, aspirin for folks with an acute heart attack, etc. The costs are obviously uh, a little bit higher than uh, prevention, but still on the order of magnitude of billions, okay, rather than trillions. And so just to highlight that the costs um, of uh, preventing uh, cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular health promotion are much uh, more affordable than the costs of letting this epidemic go rampant. So what types of interventions uh, should we do? Um, this is actually uh, Simon Capewell and his colleagues uh, have done a series of studies from around the world and have basically shown that in, uh, in general, on average, about half of the decline in mortality from cardiovascular disease is due to treatments, so treatment of acute myocardial infarction, coronary care units, etc., and about half of the decline in mortality is due to diminishment of risk factors, so uh, prevention of the development of disease in the first place. So really my sort of take-home message today is to think about both treatment and prevention and again, moving onwards from there to actually health promotion, that these are not in conflict with each other, uh, that we need all of the above. But there's a humongous care gap uh, in, the, uh, in the world. So the World Heart Federation has put that together some of these statistics that people with prior cardiovascular disease taking medicines that are uh, known to work and are prescribed to them, uh, people with stroke, less than 10% of individuals with stroke around the world are actually taking uh, guideline-directed medical therapy, uh, less than 15% of those with the myocardial infarction. So there's a humongous care gap uh, in the world. Uh, specifically to hypertension, this is work that was done by Clara Chow and others from Australia, uh, basically showing that uh, treatment for hypertension, less than 50% everywhere, and clearly worse in low-income countries and low and middle, uh, lower middle-income countries, and control of hypertension abysmal, less than 15 or 20 percent throughout the world. So the World Heart Federation has put together a 25 by 25 plan uh, to reduce uh, premature mortality from cardiovascular disease by 25 percent by the year 2025. This is in line with the 2020, 25 by 25 global target uh, from the World Health Organization uh, addressing risk factors such as alcohol, physical inactivity, uh, sodium, tobacco, blood pressure, diabetes, and really trying to focus on getting people uh, into therapy and making sure that medicines are available. So once again, the current uh, roadmaps are really di di directed towards uh, treatment and prevention, 
but we're in dialogue and I want us to try and move forward from there to really thinking about health promotion. So what is health promotion? Really, I go back now to the mid-1980s, the Ottawa Charter, that really sort of put health promotion on the map uh, and sort of built it on five different p pillars. The idea is really about empowering individuals, organizations, communities to reach a state of optimal well-being. So making sure that people who are you know, generally born healthy remain healthy rather than trying to just manage them when they're sick. So building a healthy public policy, creating supportive environments, strengthening community action, uh, developing individual personal skills, and obviously reorienting health services towards that approach as well. When we think about health promotion, we really, uh, in hand in hand, have to think about what are called the social determinants of health. So moving beyond just individuals uh, and genetics and individual pathophysiology towards social relationships, living conditions, neighborhoods, uh, social and economic policies, and sort of structures that we live in that uh, impact uh, the choices that we're able to make. When we get to uh, cardiovascular disease, how does this, uh, how does this uh, sort of manifest? I, we sort of think about it in terms of this, what we call the health promotion py pyramid, uh, where really uh, the bulk of the benefit will come from really dealing with the environment, communities, healthy public policy, uh, supportive environments, et cetera. Uh, and then obviously onwards from lower risk populations all the way to people with active disease. As we know, generally medicine tends to focus really on the tip of the iceberg or the top of the pyramid. But really uh, cardiovascular health promotion requires interventions at all levels and really with a focus on trying to address the population. And so again, I don't want us to think about this as things that are in conflict with each other. All of the above obviously are necessary. People are gonna get sick. They're gonna have to come to us for uh, management of, tr of illness. Uh, but we should really think about moving upstream in terms of making sure that people remain healthy. Um, one of the things that uh, we have done uh, is to engage in implementation research uh, while trying to implement uh, some of these um, activities and some of these interventions. The idea is to really see what is it about implementation that works, what is it about implementation that does not work. Um, and figure out why and figure out what lessons can be uh, applied not just to the individual program but also globally. And so implementation research is about identifying the problem, analyzing the determinants, developing solutions, implementing and then evaluating those outcomes. It's a very multidisciplinary or transdisciplinary research uh, paradigm uh, using qualitative methods, quantitative methods, cost effectiveness and economic methods borrowing from our business and tech colleagues in terms of supply chain logistics, IT, and human performance engineering. So it's a fun uh, and very exciting field to be in. So now the roadmaps. Um, so th these are slides borrowed from the World Heart Federation uh, that we put together. The way that they did this was to uh, create, to sort of think about roadblocks in the sort of pathway towards uh, health and then think about ways to sort of get around those roadblocks. Okay, so these roadblocks uh, could be related to health systems, clinical guidelines, and uh, uh, providers, uh, the availability of medications and interventions, uh, affordability, uh, the organization of the healthcare system, and obviously patients and families. So now we think about roadblocks and potential solutions. So again, I just want to sort of highlight these slides specific to the idea of prevention of disease and treatment, but again, sort of thinking about moving now beyond to health promotion as well. So in terms of reorganization of the health system, really thinking about uh, strengthening the role of primary care, really thinking about a population health approach, which is obviously the sort of new key word uh, in, in almost every circle. So now I just want to sort of talk about a little bit about my work in Kenya. Uh, the work uh, happens with a group called AMPATH, uh, which is, stands for the Academic Model for uh, Providing uh, Access to Healthcare. AMPATH was established in 2001, a uh, catchment area of about 3.5 million in Western Kenya. It started off actually as an HIV, so in addition to being an educational partnership between Moy University in Kenya and a consortium of institutions in the United States and Canada, uh, really launched a, a very um, aggressive HIV uh, treatment campaign in, 2000 and, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, really um, with assistance from PEPFAR, uh, the, the, the funding mechanism from the Bush administration. Um, currently uh, has at least had about 150,000 HIV positive patients enrolled in their program and, ha and has been one of the leading uh, sort of partners or uh, 
interveners in terms of thinking about HIV now as a chronic disease in places in Sub-Saharan Africa, whereas before it really was a death sentence. One of the key things to this academic partnership is that it's about leading with care. Very different approach to international academic partnerships relative to other ones that generally uh, tend to take place. Uh, the idea is really sort of everything is focused on care delivery and only after care delivery is satisfied do we think about education and do we think about layering on research. And really taking on a population-based approach to care, leveraging now the HIV infrastructure that has been well established towards chronic disease care, including cardiovascular disease, uh, and engaging in implementation research, as I mentioned. So uh, as I mentioned, population health being a, a, a sort of a critical linchpin uh, for this approach. And the nice thing about uh, the Kenyan system where we work is that uh, we work within the Ministry of Health system. It's a public system. Uh, it really sort of addresses the entire population. You can capture everybody. It's not uh, like trying to work in New York where your neighbor may be taken care of by someone at Cornell and the guy across the street may be taken care of by someone at, by, at Columbia, and trying to sort of engage in a sort of population health approach from Sinai's perspective, I think, is logistically incredibly challenging. Here, everybody is Ministry of Health. And so you're able to integrate all the way from the community grassroots workers, community health workers, all the way up to subspecialist physicians at tertiary uh, care hospitals. And we've engaged at every single one of these levels. What are some of these principles of leverage uh, for to moving from HIV to chronic disease that uh, align with this approach to population health? Home-based testing and counseling. So literally, we're walking door to door uh, uh, in the rural areas of Western Kenya, knocking on people's doors, going to their farms, uh, going to their um, places of work, and testing them for HIV, but now also testing them for hypertension and diabetes as well. Uh, aggressively linking and retaining them to the care system, decentralization of clinical services, so moving again beyond uh, hospitals and centralized clinics to really rural dispensaries and working with community health workers, task redistribution, strategic use of M Health, an integrated electronic health record across these entire systems of care, uh, maintaining a consistent secure drug supply, and really thinking about innovative care delivery models. So I'll talk about each of these in turn briefly. Uh, these are some of our um, uh, nurses working actually at one of the rural dispensaries. So probably about the size of just this like, sort of front area here. Um, someone was asking, where do they go to get their drugs? They literally go to the next room. Uh, and then as I said, door-to-door uh, -door testing of everybody really. So this is actually a woman who just gave birth to a little baby and we're trying to capture the entire population, families maintaining them healthy. So the next roadblock that was identified by the World Heart Federation uh, was about lack of healthcare professionals. So the idea about bypassing that roadblock was to think about task redistribution. So going back again to our concept of population health, the answer that we've come up with in Kenya is called FLITTER, find, link, treat, and retain. So finding everybody, as I mentioned, linking them to care, getting them into an appropriate treatment regimen, and retaining them. The previous system really was that the community was left on their own and sort of would navigate the, so their way basically to the hospital to get their cardiovascular disease taken care of. Doctors were the only ones and still are really the only ones al allowed by law to, uh, to, get, to prescribe antihypertensives. We've secured an agreement with the Ministry of Health to be able to, in our geography, test out uh, task redistribution and allow nurses to actually have prescribing capabilities. So what we've been able to do now is find people, link them into their local dispensaries that are run by nurses, not physicians, and the bulk of people are actually taken care of here, and only the complicated, uncontrolled cases now have to be referred up to the health center and the hospital. These dispensaries, much nearer by the community members, run by nurses who are actually neighbors to these uh, uh, community members, and so it, it actually is a much stronger link to the community than the previous system. So we've been able to actually try and evaluate this program of nurse management of hypertension using this implementation research approach to test out the feasibility and impact of nurse management of hypertension. The, the idea is to try and inform the development of uh, scalable and sustainable strategies, not just in Kenya, but elsewhere in the world. And what we've been able to show actually is that nurses can do this well. Okay, so we started off with a cohort of patients, nearly a thousand of them, uh, with average blood pressures almost near 170 over 100, 
And over the course of uh, 12 months, we're able to reduce their systolic pressure by over 20 points uh, and their diastolic pressure by about 10. You can see that the majority of that obviously happened early, but we were able to sustain that out to 12 months. And so task redistribution can happen uh, and clinical decision support can work in low resource settings. We've also now moved beyond just nurses to think about how can we actually engage community health workers really in the villages to bring people back into the care system. So this is a study uh, led by Dr. Fuster called Optimizing Linkage and Retention to Hypertension Care, the LARC Hypertension Study. The idea here is again an implementation research approach to address the challenge of linking and retaining individuals to care. So what we noticed was nurses can control hypertension but over half of the people never, uh, ended up not either showing up or not remaining in care for those 12 months. And so that was the critical problem that we were trying to address here. And what we thought was that community health workers equipped with a tailored behavioral communication strategy as well as a smartphone-based tool uh, would be able to improve linkage and retention and thereby significantly reduce blood pressure. So this is the little sort of diagram that sort of describes our, our project, uh, starting with really a community-based participatory research approach, really trying to get at what do community members and different stakeholders think about this program, using a design thinking approach, which is something that is used in uh, sort of the tech circles, Apple, Google, et cetera, but now applying it to actually behavior change and working in low resource settings uh, and designing our intervention, subjecting it obviously to a cluster randomized trial and also doing cost effectiveness analysis. So one of the first things that we did, and this was actually done by one of our students here at Mount Sinai, Alex Douglas, who will be graduating soon, was to test the content validity of this intervention. So as I mentioned, we used design thinking to develop this tool and then she subjected it to content validity testing and iterative modification. So those results are gonna be coming out soon. <coughs> And one of the things, then we implemented the, the, the intervention amongst our community health workers. And one of the things that we decided to do was called process evaluation. Really the idea behind process evaluation is figure out what's working, what's not working, who is it working for, who is it not working for, why, and why not. And what we found out actually was that in terms of, so we trained our community health workers as I mentioned. Uh, subjected them to actually pretty intensive training sessions on hypertension and risk factor modification, et cetera. And their scores in terms of, this is now six to 12 months later, their scores in terms of knowledge retention were pretty high across the board, except with respect to symptoms and side effects. So there was obviously some areas that needed to be uh, worked on. The nice thing about this, as I mentioned, if we go backwards is, oops, is that this iterative modification and sort of adaptive design uh, is something that I think is very critical. It's not like you can just put down an intervention and sort of allow it to be monolithically uh, continuing despite the fact that some parts of it may not be working. So this sort of idea of adaptive design and iterative learning I think is very important. Similarly, when we looked at fidelity, meaning did they actually do what we asked them to do, uh, in terms of we actually subjected them to OSCE, similar to what we do here in the medical school. Um, and these are now community health workers in rural Kenya. And uh, in terms of establishing rapport and taking in the history, they actually scored pretty badly. What was interesting actually was that men seemed to actually outscore women in terms of the ability to establish rapport um, and to actually engage in counseling. So this was a little bit curious to us. We sort of expected women to be a little bit more empathetic, but somehow the, the men ended up scoring a little bit higher. Uh, we're still trying to figure that part out. Actually, sorry, let me just mention, this was actually done by one of our preventive medicine residents, Aline Frawley. So the next roadblock is about guidelines not being available or recommendations being too complex. And so really the solutions that the uh, committee from the WHF came up with was about uh, trying to think about fixed dose combinations for cardiovascular drugs. So this is work actually that Dr. Fuster has uh, been very active in, which is the cardiovascular polypill, putting together several components uh, into one pill. So usually aspirin, one or more antihypertensives, one or, uh, and then usually a lipid lowering agent as well. What we've been able to show, Dr. Fuster's team and others have been able to show that adherence increases significantly with the uh, uh, adherence to a poly pill. So Dr. Fuster's focus trial showing a significant increase in adherence and other trials from around the world have shown the same. The idea being that there's hopefully a promise that simplifying regimens and putting them into certain packages may actually be 
better. These were all done secondary prevention for the most part, uh, but the idea is that maybe for even lower risk individuals, it may be useful. Now again, I want to sort of move us beyond just thinking about treatment to think about packages of interventions for health promotion as well. And so not just focusing, I know that there have been community-based trials looking at uh, multiple risk factor interventions for cardiovascular disease, Mr. Fit, for example, about 30 years ago, that tended not to work. But I, my sense is that if we look very closely at those trials, uh, we can come up with packages that may actually be able to work uh, in our setting now. The next roadblock is that, uh, that the, uh, we thought about was about healthcare professionals needing education and needing capacity building in terms of uh, being able to be aware and implement guidelines. So one of the things that we have done in Kenya with our nurses is to actually use uh, mobile technology uh, in, uh, embedded with uh, clinical decision support to try and uh, improve their adherence to the simple guidelines that we've been uh, implementing there. So this is sort of a three-step process involving uh, the use of mobile technology for data entry and validation, and then the decision support, and then finally linking it with the central med uh, electronic medical record that I was mentioning. These two parts are relatively straightforward. <coughs> linking this to the electronic medical record is very challenging. So I, I just want to sort of put you into rural Kenya, uh, out in really literally the boonies, uh, no network, no internet, and trying to sort of link yourself back to the sort of this electronics uh, uh, medical record in the, in the tertiary hospital, a very challenging uh, logistical thing, but we've been able to successfully do it. We evaluated early on for feasibility, and what we came up with was that the technical issues are obviously challenging, server issues, cellular network, hardware, et cetera. But actually equally or even more challenging were some of the human uh, issues related to implementation, program administration, training of the programmers, incentives for the uh, folks who are actually going to be using it, and even uh, uh, some of the sort of barriers at the patient level. And so what we realized, and this is one of the lessons that we've been able to now share with others is that you have to move beyond just thinking about the technical stuff, but really think about the interaction between humans and machines. The next uh, uh, sort of set of roadblocks and solutions was again thinking about healthcare professionals and how to sort of act on uh, opinion leaders locally and align incentives with what we're hoping them to do. One of the things that uh, uh, folks at Duke in particular, uh, but with our uh, involvement as well here at Mount Sinai, uh, have been able to do in Kenya is to really establish a cardiovascular care um, system. We've actually built a CCU in, uh, in Eldoret, Kenya. We have faculty who regularly go and rotate there. Um, but it is a huge process that, uh, again, has taken several years and several different components. It's a very sort of... Um, uh, involved picture, but the idea is that there's had to be interventions across issues related to leadership, health workforce, health service delivery, health financing, access to medicines, and health information systems. So you can imagine it's really about putting together an entire system and requires players from, from many, many different fields. These are just some of the photographs from our work in Kenya. This is the CCU we built. This is actually the chronic disease building that was also built, both houses, research up top, as well as clinical uh, facilities on the bottom. Just moving in clockwise direction, this is my colleague Jerry Bloomfield from Duke actually showing uh, a transesophageal echocardiogram in the CCU. Uh, several levels of capacity building that are happening here at the level of physician, nurse, uh, and staff members as well. Here's our outpatient cardiology clinic, and then also moving again beyond just the clinic out into the community and thinking about health promotion and engaging communities as well. Uh, an invitation now to faculty from the Department of Medicine. We would love to have your involvement. Mount Sinai now is an official member of the AMPATH Consortium, and it's a really an incredible experience to, to work there. One of the other roadblocks was about priority interventions not being available. So really thinking about how can you increase the availability of, uh, of the interventions that you want. So one of the things that, again, my colleagues at uh, Kenya have done is what's the idea of this revolving fund pharmacy. The idea is to give an initial donation of drugs. You sell the drugs at cost, funds are generated, and then you use those same funds to replenish your inventory. And so the idea is to not really necessarily make a profit, but just be able to replenish your supply. And all it's required is an initial seed funding. So it's a sustain, sort of an inherently sustainable revolving uh, cycle. So the idea is basically like giving farmers seeds in one year 
allowing them to farm, harvest, and then use those same seeds to sort of plant for the next year. And so for, in terms of thinking about partnerships between high resource settings and low resource settings, a very nice example of a sustainable solution to drug supply. What are the results of this revolving fund? So this is the sort of model. Uh, patients go for their clinical visit, they go to the, uh, get their prescription, they go to the ministry health pharmacy. If medicines are not available, then they sort of revert to this revolving fund pharmacy. So you can say here, this is a percent availability prior to the revolving fund pharmacy availability, really low at like less than 40%. And immediately after the initiation of the revolving fund pharmacy, nearly 100% availability of medicines across the board, non-communicable disease as well as communicable disease uh, medicines. So really an incredible uh, improvement in availability of medicines and therefore access to these drugs for rural populations. But the challenge still remains that's a supply side solution, not a demand side solution, meaning that these medicines are still quite unaffordable for a majority of the population. And the, um, we, we really think about what we call the axis of access, meaning that it's not just supply all the way from the WHO down to uh, local pharmacies, but really sort of end users, patients and providers that we need to take into account. One of the things that, um, one of the things that we realized was that there's a lack of transparency at the level of the transaction, ultimate transaction. So basically what happens is I'm a rural patient in Kenya. I get a prescription, which is a piece of paper. I don't understand what's said on it. I go to the pharmacist. I hand this piece of paper over. I get a packet of things that I then have to pay for and sort of pop in my mouth. I have no idea what sort of what I'm taking, what is it for, how much am I supposed to pay, et cetera. Anecdotally, but I'm pretty sure this is actually more systematically present than we think, uh, Patients are either price gouged, sort of told that things that should cost, let's say, 10 shillings are actually charged 100 shillings for them, or they're told, you know, I don't have the drug here, but you go down the road to the private pharmacy and you'll find it there. The private pharmacy is actually now owned by the, you know, cousin or the brother-in-law of the person working at the public pharmacy. Um, and so there's no transparency at the level of the, um, at the level of transactions. So we came up with this idea called Wikimeds, uh, which is still in the planning phases, but I think is potentially very exciting. The idea is really to increase transparency uh, uh, related to price, availability, quality of, of, of the drugs uh, and to use mobile technology to do that. So the idea would be something like the following. You get a drug, let's say hydrochlorothiazide, and you're charged 100 shillings, that's the sort of Kenyan currency, and you sort of type into your cell phone, even if it's a dumb phone, just to say, hey, I'm being charged uh, 100 shillings for hydrochlorothiazide. It goes to the Wikimed server the Wikimed server is actually able to access publicly available prices, which are sort of negotiated between governments and pharmaceutical companies, and spits back to you a message that says, hey, you should actually only be charged 10 shillings a tablet for this medicine. So now you're armed with this, inf oh, sorry, you're armed with this information at the level of the patient. And so now you're able to enter into that sort of transaction with the pharmacist in a much more informed manner. Then think about crowdsourcing this information. So, uh, let's say Mr. Joseph in Kenya is charged now 10 times the price that he should be for this medicine. All the, you know, the Wikimeds now twitters this out to everybody in the world. And it comes to, you know, David Thomas's uh, uh, Twitter account saying, hey, are you outraged by the fact that this guy's being charged 10 times more than he should be? Make it very easy for David to just say, yes, I'm outraged by this. <laughs> <laughs> Collect all those Twitter responses and then dump them on the Minister of Health every month. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, I think it feels to me like very promising, but it also feels a little bit risky um, uh, in terms of, you know, sort of uh, um, whistleblowers, etc. But I think it's a potentially exciting idea that we have yet to try and move forward. The, this type of idea has actually been used also for gasoline prices. This was in Canada. And, and you can imagine that, you know, this type of price map that they've been able to do for gasoline prices uh, you could actually do for pharmaceuticals as well. And there's actually a company in the United States called GoodRx.com that actually is already doing that here. And I think it would be nice to try and sort of move that uh, elsewhere as well. But in terms of really addressing uh, the demand side, one of the new things that we've done, which I think is very exciting, is uh, a, a project called BigPick that we've just started, bridging income generation with group integrated care. Again, uh, working with my colleagues in Kenya. And the idea behind BigPick is to combine microfinance with group medical visits. So bring people together to make money. Okay, so the microfinance is something that's quite often used, started in Bangladesh, has now been sort of moved elsewhere in the world, but bring them together to make money. 
But while they're there, slap a blood pressure cuff on them, poke them with a needle to like check their glucose, etc., and now engage them in a group medical visit at the same time. We think that this will actually change social network characteristics, hopefully leading to changes in intermediate factors such as diet, physical activity, medications, and retention and care, and ultimately lead to cardiovascular risk reduction in our population. So this is again the sort of outline uh, again, sort of a community-based participatory research approach, again, using design thinking to design the intervention, subjecting it to a cluster randomized trial, uh, and really doing uh, mediation and moderation analysis, which I'm happy to go into in more detail uh, about social network characteristics and ultimately a cost-effectiveness analysis. The design uh, process involves multiple stakeholders from across the spectrum of people who are involved in the care delivery system. Pharmacists, uh, this is our microfinance expert, community leaders, uh, community nurses, again, another pharmacist here. So really sort of trying to get input from the entire stakeholder group involved with this, uh, with this plan. So we're just at the beginning stages. We're about to launch the trial in the next couple of months. So um, hopefully in the next year or two, we'll have results that we'll be able to share. Moving now finally to patients and community members not being aware of the importance of uh, and need for and access to some of these interventions and really thinking about uh, now again moving beyond just uh, the medical system to populations and communities. So this is work that Dr. Fustra has led that I've had the privilege of being involved with, uh, targeting children, targeting adults. So this is results from our work in Colombia where we targeted preschool children and integrated into their preschool curriculum uh, you know, 50 to 70 hours of really health related curriculum related to diet, physical activity, uh, knowledge about your heart, knowledge about your body, but also very importantly, emotional management, which I think is actually a critical piece uh, to the puzzle. And what we were able to show was that the intervention groups, uh, whether it be children, parents, or teachers, all uh, scored much higher on our outcome measures, which is really by uh, questionnaire-based uh, activities and habits um, uh, at six months. And then once we sort of crossovered and did the same intervention for the controls, you can see that the controls generally tended to catch up. Separately and independently, uh, Dr. Fuster and his team in Spain have looked at bringing groups together, similar to what I was describing in Kenya, but here not for medical care, but really for behavior change. Uh, and bringing groups of adults together to sort of support each other, lead each other, talk through issues with each other related to risk factor modification and lifestyle and behavior modification. And again, showing that from baseline out to one year follow up uh, that intervention participants scored higher on their behavioral risk scores than uh, on their behavioral uh, sort of um, uh, behavioral scores than uh, than the control groups and we're sort of following these people out several years beyond what we decided to do was to take the lessons from children take the lessons from adults and put it all together and so this is what we're doing now in Harlem with the Familia project is really looking at a family based approach to cardiovascular health and why focus on the family? We think that there are several mechanisms or reasons why the family is important. Obviously, families, there's a mutual interdependence within families. Uh, there's a shared environment that families have. Parenting style is important. Uh, perceptions of uh, what it means to be physically active, what it means to have a good diet, et cetera, will be important for children. And then genomics, uh, uh, clearly. And the idea is that hopefully through a family-based approach, we can improve cardiovascular health. And so we're putting this to, and then finally, let me just make one quick comment about systems genetics. So it's really sort of an exciting field and an exciting sort of extension of our work, uh, something that I'm obviously not expert in, but our team members are. But the idea is to take into account DNA, but not just DNA, but genomic activity, uh, you know, genomics, metabolomics, et cetera, clinical phenotypes, and now environmental factors, such as health behavior, some of those environmental factors that I was mentioning to you. Think about how all of these things come together and actually affect what we call quote unquote regulatory or causal gene networks and the activity of these networks. Combine this now with GWAS data as well as some data from external data sets. And again, sort of think about the activity and connectivity of these gene networks and use that information now to target uh, cardiovascular health promotion uh, interventions towards individuals, families, communities, and populations. So very exciting new direction that I think our team is moving in. We're trying to manifest this in the familial study in Harlem. 
uh, being led by Dr. Fuster, Dr. Samir Bonswal, uh, also very involved, and several of our house staff also very involved as well. <clears throat> um, again, targeting children and their caregivers. Happy to go into this in more detail, but the idea is that we have, you know, obviously controlled and intervention groups, and amongst the adults, looking at both individual level interventions as well as group interventions, similar to what I was discussing before. And in addition to measuring uh, questionnaire reported uh, habits and behaviors, also looking at biological outcomes as well as genomics, as I mentioned. So again, these are the general sort of outline of the roadmaps, looking all the way from the health system through the healthcare providers, affordability and availability of interventions, and looking at populations and communities. So in conclusion, cardiovascular disease is a global problem. I hope I've been able to impress that upon you, that it's an especially big problem in low and middle income countries, both from a health and economic perspective, that there are very large treatment and prevention gaps, but that we have these roadmaps that hopefully will be able to be implemented and uh, improve the situation, not just for management and prevention, but also really now moving towards health promotion, both at the global and local level, and engaging in not just implementation, but research about uh, the implementation as well. Uh, in terms of thinking specifically about health promotion roadmaps, really, again, thinking about health systems, population health, uh, strategic use of human resources as well as technology, thinking not just about availability, uh, supply-side issues, but also affordability and demand-side issues, and really sort of thinking about fam patients, families, communities, neighborhoods. So these are all the sort of collaborators on the various projects that I work with, and thank you. We have time for some questions, Carlos. Uh, yeah. Um, one thing I guess you didn't bring up: what is the role, um, culturally and perhaps legally, of privacy, HIPAA equivalencies in Kenya, particularly with the community workers engaging with people they may know from their villages or their neighborhoods in terms of information sharing? Yeah. Thank you for that question. Obviously, very important. Um, we do actually include in our training issues related to privacy and confidentiality. Uh, many of these uh, in, uh, uh, interactions are happening uh, privately in people's homes. Um, we do encourage our community health workers also to try and find private locations if they're uh, not necessarily in people's homes, but potentially out in the community. It obviously is uh, more of a challenge than being able to sequester somebody into a, a clinic room, uh, but it is something that we pay close attention to. Yeah, well, first of all, congratulations on taking such a uh challenging subject. Thank you. Uh, I, I came in a few minutes late, apologies. On the electronic inter internet, it was li listed as an annual secular lecture. Did you mention something about Dr. Secular? I, I did, yes, sir, yeah. Well, I knew him very well, and I'll just take one moment to Please. say he was, he was an outstanding clinician and teacher, I would say, in the top 5% at Sinai. Uh, he was also a great athlete, so he had a scholarship in football to Tulane University and tore up his knee, at which time he applied for a scholarship in basketball to Syracuse, which he got. So when he got to be 30 years old, he came to Elmhurst as chief of medicine and joined the Forest Hills Tennis Club, a very fancy club, and he, didn't, you know, he was from Brooklyn, he, he knew about tennis like I know about swimming. <laughs> so he asked the manager to arrange a game for him, and then he tells me this story, he says, Les, I come to the Forest Hills Tennis Club, and there's this old guy, 70-year-old guy with Parkinson's, it's my opponent. <laughs> so I was embarrassed, so the guy beat him. Because Sekwa didn't really remember that Parkinson's patients stopped shaking when they take an intention moves, so the guy beat him in tennis. I always love that story. Uh, I have a more medical question for you. <laughs> um, what is your view of the possibility that cardiovascular diseases are due to an infection like virus? Uh, yeah, well, let me just first comment that uh, I appreciate the story about uh, Dr. Seckler. As I had mentioned at the beginning, uh, he seems like an amazing man, and I really wish that I had been able to know him, and I'm sure those who did uh, consider themselves very lucky. Uh, in terms of the interaction between infectious and non-communicable diseases, including cardiovascular, obviously there's going to be some interaction there. Uh, there, is, uh, th there are very direct links, specifically rheumatic heart disease, et cetera, but even with atherosclerotic uh, cardiovascular disease, there are issues related to inflammation that may be related to a variety of separate etiologies, whether they be infectious or non-infectious, and so the possibility is there. Obviously, 
a lot of connections between dental health, oral health, and uh, cardiovascular health as well, potentially related to the microbes, et cetera. So uh, I think the science is still evolving, uh, but I think the potential connection is there for sure. There's, it was fascinating to see you describe some of the work that's done with community health workers, uh, both in low and middle income countries and low, low and middle income communities. Um, do you think it's possible, having looked at all these systems of care across places like East and Central Harlem and in Kenya, that community health workers can be just as impactful in high income communities? Are they, is it something that is potentially as acceptable, or is there some kind of um, obstacle there that would not allow us to use that same intervention to take care of people who? have insurance and are able to advocate for themselves, but still are not, don't know and have great health outcomes. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, and uh, it would be interesting to actually ask sort of what our, Sinai's efforts are in this, uh, in this area. Um, I can say definitely in low and low-income countries amongst high-income or high-resource settings within those countries, there's, uh, there's definitely, it feels to me, an acceptance of this type of uh, sort of door-to-door -door visits and engagement Etc. And I think sort of an, a welcoming of that in a way that it feels different here, just from an anecdotal perspective. I think if someone randomly walked, knocked on my door and said, hey, I want to check your blood pressure and blood sugar, et cetera, I'd sort of be like, you know, get out of here. Mm -hmm. um, but there's an acceptance of that sort of engagement uh, in, in, in places like Kenya uh, that feel to me to be different. I can't speak to it uh, from any sort of data-based perspective. Yeah. The problem, I think, with prevention many times is what is the reward? I mean, that's very difficult because when you start popping pills and stuff like that, the reward, you may never, ever find it because you live longer, but you don't, there's nothing tangible. So how do you get people long run to continue on what you're doing? Is there any ideas on yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Smith. So, very good question. I think, actually, to be honest with you, the move towards health promotion actually is, is actually something that will be very important in that way. People actually enjoy being healthy. People actually enjoy maintaining health. And I think if we were to focus on that, focus on, quote, unquote, fun, focus on love, focus on activities, focus on being able to do the things that you love to do, uh, I think that sort of approach will actually be very beneficial. It needs to happen now from, uh, again, very upstream levels. Uh, increasing walkability, increasing bikeability, improving food supply, et cetera, making those choices easier for people to be able to participate in. Mike, you Mike. Yeah. So uh, the um, question of dollars is a very important one. And uh, obviously a dollar for health will go much further to support these local nurses or health workers and dealing with the population. But to what degree are you able to go to the governments of these poor countries and convince them that they shouldn't do so many cabbages or stents or valve replacements because you can help so many more people for so many more years with the uh, simpler methods. Sure, yeah, thank you for that question. I mean, I think it's a, a conundrum for all uh, countries, not just low and middle income countries. We face that same challenge here. Um, but I think that w one obviously uh, issue is to make sure that the data are strong and that the evidence is strong. Um, and again, uh, beyond just evidence and data, I think we have to sort of be advocates and be able to sort of say, hey, we as individuals, we as communities, uh, we as now representatives of our patients and their families and communities value this thing uh, and this approach. And I think that message also needs to be uh, uh, promoted to you know, policymakers uh, and people in decision-making power. Um, I, I think that there are trends moving in that direction here, in particular, obviously, with some of the healthcare changes that are happening. Uh, you, know, you see Mount Sinai actually preparing for moving towards a systems-based approach or a population-based approach. Uh, the threat of uh, being either penalized or not reimbursed for readmissions has actually shifted us in that direction. Uh, you look at actually uh, numbers of uh, procedures that are being done and appropriateness criteria being met, et cetera. There are moves in that direction. And my sense is that uh, we may not necessarily feel that on a day-to-day -day basis, but the, 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 the pendulum is swinging. One last question, Henry. Uh, first, great talk, and if we are doing wonderful work, uh, related question about dealing with the government. I just saw on PBS NewsHour this week a story about 
government corruption in Kenya and how a billion dollars in euro bonds have seemed to have just disappeared into people's pockets and how the government retaliates against whistleblowers. So I just wanted, to, and you talked a little bit about that with your drug pricing, but could you talk a little bit more? Has that impacted the work that you're doing? What's been your experience with that? Yeah, thank you for that. So obviously, uh, corruption and public servants not acting in the public's benefit, uh, not just a problem for Kenya, but a problem worldwide. Uh, and I think that uh, important for all of us to really uh, try and hammer home uh, to those people who are representing us uh, and, to, and to also f sort of advocate for the creation of systems that allow for that type of feedback to happen in a more transparent and more effective manner, I think very important. So again, on behalf of the department, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Sekhar's family who was here with us today and supporting this lectureship. And uh, many of his family is graduates of our school. And in two years, we actually will have his grandson who will be coming to school with us. So uh, a lot of big shoes to fill, Solomon, so good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so let's thank uh,